In the second video on thyroid gland pathology, I'm going to focus on uh, hypothyroidism primarily. I'll say a few words about goiter and some of the causes of goiter. Be sure to be familiar with the material in the last video where we talked about the assessment tools, in particular the uh, serology tests. So understand what the normal or current guideline reference ranges are for TSH and uh, free T4 in particular. So before we talk about hypothyroidism, I just want to mention a few things about goiter. Um, goiter is just an enlarged thyroid gland uh, from many, many different causes. Uh, it's the most common thyroid abnormality. Um, there's different metabolic patterns of goiter, so we can have an inactive goiter, and that would be uh, basically uh, an enlarged thyroid that can have a low or even normal thyroid hormone output. We call that euthyroid or a non-toxic goiter. Um, an active or so-called toxic goiter is actually hypersecreting thyroid hormone, and that would lead to a state of thyrotoxicosis. Uh, so it's important to kind of differentiate those two. Um, there can be different growth patterns. So the goiter can be diffusely enlarged. In other words, there's uniform uh, enlargement of the goiter. It can be uninodular, where we feel um, one area of the thyroid enlarged. Um, and it feels, if you palpate it, kind of like a giant lymph node, but it's, it's usually much harder than that or it could be multi-nodular, and uh, so there can be many little nodes. And again, these uh, nodules can be inactive, uh, they can be euthyroid, or they can be active or toxic. So you might hear the word toxic uh, nodule, and that would be um, hypersecreting. Um, the size of goiters vary. So a class one goiter is what we call a palpation goiter. You can only detect it on palpation, so it's not visible. Class two, you can see it, so if you're talking to your patient, you notice this enlargement in the neck. Um, it can be seen. That's usually a class two. A class three is very large. Uh, there's usually compression marks around it. So in this picture over here uh, to the right, you know, we have sort of a class two, even class three goiter in this patient, and definitely a class three goiter uh, down below here. Um, the causes vary. And um, so worldwide, I mentioned that iodine deficiency is one of the primary causes. What happens is that the uh, thyroglobulin begins to accumulate in the colloid uh, in those follicles, uh, but it's not iodinated. So it just keeps growing, growing, growing. Um, the TSH levels are you know, ex increasing to try to stimulate the thyroid to release more thyroid hormone because you're not releasing enough thyroid hormone. And that excess TSH causes thyroid gland hypertrophy. Um, it could also be due to thyroiditis, and that could be either infectious, so thyroiditis just means inflammation of the thyroid, and that can be from infection, which is least common, uh, or most commonly, I've mentioned several times now, the autoimmune thyroiditis. Uh, the autoimmune thyroiditis causing low thyroid or hypothyroidism would be Hashimoto syndrome, um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or causing hyperthyroidism would be Graves' disease. Um, and then there could be thyroid nodules and even thyroid cancer can cause a goiter or be associated with goiter. Uh, so there's different types. So collagen goiter, um, this is the one most common with iodine deficiency. Uh, the follicles uniformly accumulate colloid and the gland has a smooth, uh, diffusely enlarged appearance. You can have a nodular goiter. And again, that's where the gland um, continues to enlarge, usually due to iodine deficiency as well. And the follicles, in this case, become cystic and uh, irregularly sized. Remember, a cyst is hollow, so form, they form a hollow center. And that can be differentiated on ultrasound. Those are not uh, usually, they don't have any metastatic potential. A sporadic goiter is a goiter that occurs without a known cause. And usually this, we see this, for example, in pregnancy or times when there's increased need for thyroid hormone, um, the thyroid will enlarge. So that would be a sporadic goiter. And then a toxic goiter, like in Graves' disease, would cause hypersecrete thyroid hormone, causing hyperthyroidism. So just a few things to know about goiters. So uh, be clear that you know the metabolic pattern differs with goiters, the growth pattern, the size, and then the, the different causes here. So I just want to review all the different causes of hypothyroidism. Um, so we usually think of hypothyroidism as just like iodine deficiency or autoimmune, but there's actually many potential uh, causes of hypothyroidism. So basically, this is going to be defined as low thyroid hormone levels, so low uh, free T4 in particular, with consequent low metabolism. Um, uh, many of these types can be associated with goiter, especially in the later stages, but they can also be uh, without goiter. 
Um, so the goiter itself is not a diagnostic distinguishing feature. Um, so primary hypothyroidism, remember, is a problem of output of thyroid hormone from the gland. So we get decreased hormones from the thyroid gland. And all types of primary hypothyroidism will have increased TSH because the brain is perceiving that you have low thyroid. So it's going to put out more TRH from the hypothalamus, more TSH from the pituitary, and that's going to uh, raise your thyroid levels. Um, again, nutrient deficiency and iodine deficiency is the most common cause worldwide. So we'd say a high TSH, low free T4, and no uh, thyroid autoantibodies. Um, so remember, our antibody test is an additional test that can be done um, to kind of differentiate these different uh, causes. Uh, another nutrient deficiency there is are all pockets in the world where there's selenium deficiency. Um, in the U.S., we, again, usually through all the nutrient-rich foods and whatnot, we don't have that problem. Um, but that is there are different pockets in Asia and so forth where that is an issue. Um, this also because selenium is needed to uh, for the body to synthesize glutathione, your primary protective antioxidant. Um, selenium deficiency can also lead to cancer. So there's uh, often different uh, you know cancers associated with that too. Um, but in this case, it can cause hypothyroidism. And as I mentioned in the physiology notes, both selenium and zinc. Are, as well as iodine, are all extremely important thyroid nutrients when given in the appropriate dosages. Uh, and, you know, mostly we want to get these from our food anyways, not from supplements. Um, so that's nutrient deficiency. Autoimmune thyroiditis, Hashimoto's, is the most common. And that's going to have a high TSH, low free T4, and elevated autoantibodies, especially anti-TPO and thyroglobulin. Um, now, variants of Hashimoto's would be what's called subacute lymphocytic thyroiditis. I'll talk about that a little later. And then postpartum thyroiditis that uh, begins during pregnancy. I, I'm, I'm sorry, begins after pregnancy, after delivery, uh, within one year of uh, delivery. Um, so I'll go into that one in more detail as well. Uh, infectious thyroiditis could be acute infectious thyroiditis, AIT. And that would be, uh, it's pretty rare. This would be from bacteria or fungi or parasites. Um, now, normally these, we think these are associated with low thyroid status as well, uh, because iodine in the thyroid normally prevents infection. So when that iodine uh, isn't concentrating properly in the diet, uh, in the thyroid, usually from low dietary intake, um, this uh, gonna, it's going to be more uh, common to have an infection. Uh, and this is going to be more common in immunocompromised patients. Um, as we'll see, this usually causes a painful thyroid enlargement if it's going to be enlarged. Unlike the nutrient deficiency or autoimmune thyroiditis, if there's goiter, it's going to be painless typically. Uh, in this case, the TSH is elevated, the free T4 is low, and the antibodies are normal. Um, and on CBC and things like that, you might see elevated white cell counts uh, and things that might indicate infection. Another type of infection would be viral, and that's subacute thyroiditis or dequerbens. Um, it's self-limiting, usually follows a viral-like infection, uh, and we see more granulomatous inflammation in the thyroid itself. Um, and the gland becomes very tender. The ESR, which is a marker, of course, of systemic inflammation, another lab marker, is going to be elevated, and there's often a lot of jaw and neck pain again with that. So these would be the infectious causes of thyroiditis. Um, Rydell thyroiditis, um, this is a variant here. Thyroid is replaced by fibrous tissue, uh, and that leads to hypothyroidism over time. And the uh, fibrous tissue actually mimics a uh, type of carcinoma. Um, usually it's a manifestation of what's called IG, uh, uh, IgG-related systemic disease. So uh, other conditions related to this are autoimmune pancreatitis, retroperitoneal fibrosis, and non-infectious aortitis, where the aorta becomes inflamed. Um, so these are all, um, this is uh, very, pretty rare, but um, this is a more acute and more uh, advanced form of inflammation that, it, that causes hypothyroidism. Um, the gland becomes fixed, so it's no longer movable. So remember on swallowing, it should move up and down. It shouldn't be fixed to the trachea. Um, but uh, it becomes hard, rock-like, uh, and this one also is painless. Um, and this has a high TSH, low free T4, and usually normal antibodies. But again, we might see um, some elevation, elevated markers of inflammation here. 
Um, there can be iatrogenic causes of hypothyroidism. So thyroidectomy or radioiodine treatment. Um, I mentioned the wolf shake off effect, and that's due uh, decrease of thyroid hormone due to prolonged increase uh, intake of iodine. So large amounts of iodine can suppress the thyroid. Um, radiation induced or medication induced like the lithium or amiodarone, uh, those kind of medications can uh, decrease thyroid. Here again, high TSH, low free T4, normal antibodies. Um, those would all be causes of primary hypothyroidism, the most common. And the first two, the iodine deficiency and Hashimoto's are by far the most common of those. Central hypothyroidism um, would be, again, either secondary, and that would be from the pituitary with low TSH output, or from the hypothalamus with low TRH output. Uh, and that can be due to a variety of factors. So tumors like pituitary adenoma, cranial pharyngiomas affect the hypothalamus, uh, trauma, surgery, or radiation to the pituitary, for instance, uh, potentially head injuries, but that's not too likely. Uh, autoimmune, uh, where the immune system attacks the pituitary. Uh, vascular, like Sheehan's, that happens in pregnancy and then delivery, where uh, if there's maternal hemorrhage, that drops, the, the mom might become hypovolemic, and that causes ischemia and potential infarction in the pituitary, uh, and we get a pituitary collapse, and that's called pituitary apoplexy. Uh, infiltrative disease like sarcoidosis and hemochromatosis, iron is deposited in the case of hemochromatosis in the pituitary, and that damages it. Uh, infections like TB and syphilis can infect the pituitary, and then different inherited. And here we'd have a low TSH, low free T4, and normal antibodies. And then other more, much more rare types would be congenital hypothyroidism, and that's from either thyroid dysgenesis, that's the most common cause in this category, uh, thyroid dyshormone genesis, so there's a inability to form thyroid hormones due to uh, genetic defects and the enzymes that are needed for that, and then uh, various other mutations. Here, again, low TSH, low free T4, and normal antibodies. And these would be detected in um, you know, newborns, um, so generally very early in life. And then peripheral would be very rare, and that would be like thyroid receptor mutations, uh, potential diiodinase polymorphism, so the conversion of thyroid T4 to T3 is not occurring uh, properly. And then I mentioned the non-thyroidal illness syndrome, where we get increased cytokines with increased cortisol, um, ultimately can um, uh, shift all the, all the T4 into reverse T3, which is inactive. And so that can result in a hypothyroid state. Um, now, there is uh, this condition that uh, in more functional medicine circles, this was started actually with a naturopath back, I think, in the 1980s, something called Wilson syndrome. Uh, Wilson argued that um, even outside the context of the non-thyroidal illness syndrome, a lot of people with chronic stress create a lot of reverse T3. And so they're shifting all their thyroid into reverse T3, and they are getting a state of relative hypothyroidism. So um, whereas there's some literature to maybe support some of that, um, and again, the approach there would be to actually downregulate the cortisol and work with the stress responses, um, Wilson argued that we could give sustained release T3 um, as a solution to that. And so he developed this form of sustained release T3. Now, um, I'll talk a bit about T3 therapy. The problem with T3 therapy versus T4 therapy is if you give a patient T4, the cells still have to convert that to T3. Um, and so they can buffer the amount of T3 they're getting so they don't get too much T3. Um, remember, if you get too much T3, you're going to have thyroid toxicosis. You're going to get in the heart, for example, the predisposition to arrhythmia, uh, as well as in the bone, the increased bone loss. So Wilson argued if you give a sustained release T3, you got to do a sustained release because T3 is um, has a uh, very... Uh, short half-life, so you have to give a special form where you, know, you take it once a day, maybe twice a day, and it stays in the blood longer. He argued that if you give the sustained release T3, T3 gets right into the cell and can do its job. The problem with that is that the cell then would have no way to buffer the amount of T3. And so this kind of treatment led to a lot of symptoms, and uh, some people out there are still using it. A lot of the kind of guideline organizations suggest this is not good practice because um, there is a very high risk of thyroid toxicosis and even subtle over time problems with bone loss and, again, the increased incidence of arrhythmia. 
Um, I'll talk about strategies where we can try to optimize the T4 to T3 conversion, which is really what you want to focus on, not so much just slamming the body with more T3. Um, I was in a practice where this was done for a while, and it, it, there was so many symptomatic patients um, from you know anxiety, insomnia, sweating, palpitations, um, and this was all from, I think, in my personal opinion, inappropriate use of uh, the T3. So just be aware of that. You might see that again in more naturopathic functional medicine circles where people are using the uh, free T3 therapy, sustained release. Um, now there is a role for free T3, not sustained release, but uh, the shorter release, uh, usually taken twice a day in some patients who don't respond to the T4. And uh, it's also found, T3 is found in the natural desiccated thyroid therapy. So I'll talk all about that when we talk about the treatments. So in the US, the most common form of hypothyroidism, again, is Hashimoto. So I'm gonna pretty much focus on that. I'll say a bit about the other autoimmune thyroiditis here in a bit. Um, but Hashimoto's is chronic thyroiditis, it's autoimmune. Um, Again, most common cause of hypothyroidism in the U.S. The clinical markers really are, you know, signs of hypothyroidism together with the elevated uh, antithyroid peroxidase and antithyroid globulin antibodies. Um, interestingly, in the early stages, and this could be for years, 5, 10, even more years, the TSH and free T4 levels are either in the normal or in what we call the subclinical range. Subclinical is when the TSH goes, remember the uh, kind of current guidelines suggest 0.4 to 4.2 uh, milli units per liter are actually this the kind of normal range for TSH. Um, when TSH goes above 4.2, but the free T4 stays in its normal range, that is known as subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, and so a lot of people in early Hashimoto's will have elevated antibodies, but they'll be either euthyroid or subclinical with their thyroid function tests. Um, about 5% of those subclinical cases will progress to avert hypothyroidism each year. So that's why we do uh, are interested in those antibodies, at least for initial screening, uh, to be, um, you know, maybe more vigilant about monitoring those patients for progression into full-blown hypothyroidism. Um, typically, Hashimoto's causes a diffuse goiter. So not nodular, but diffuse with an intact thyroid capsule, unlike Rydell's where that capsule becomes uh, scarred and affixed uh, to the trachea and the surrounding structures. Um, in Hashimoto's, it still remains movable. Um, the incidence is seven to, seven to 15 times more common in females than males. Um, and the incidence usually begins between the age of 30 and 50. Um, we see an increased incidence up until the age of 70 and both males and females, and then it drops off after that. So kind of interesting, and that's probably because after 65, 70, your immune system uh, really slows down. So even autoimmune disease seems to slow down at that point because those immune forces weaken. Um, the estimates are that it affects about 5% of the U.S. population at any point in time. Now, what's interesting is that the rates are increasing. Uh, there's been a tenfold increase in Hashimoto's over the last three decades in places like Sicily, where they have a very controlled, fairly controlled patient population. They've seen the incidence go up dramatically over the three decades. And that's interesting because it suggests the cause of this is not genetic. Uh, genes don't mutate that quickly, uh, that it's most likely environmental. So um, one of the things about the thyroid which makes it more susceptible to Hashimoto's is the presence of oxidizing enzymes like thyroid peroxidase. So thyroid peroxidase, which normally converts the uh, iodide ion into the iodine, um, oxidizes it. Um, this is uh, also able to oxidize other compounds, including environmental toxins. And once they become oxidized, they become basically free radicals and they uh, are able to scavenge electrons and cause damage to whatever tissue they're found in. In the case of the thyroid, it almost concentrates these things. And um, if the glutathione levels are low within the thyroid follicular cells, uh, then a person's at much, more, uh, much higher risk uh, for that actually occurring. So that's one reason we think the thyroid is very susceptible to environmental uh, damage. Uh, Hakaru Hashimoto was a Japanese surgeon who trained in Germany um, in the late 18, uh, early 1900s. Um, he published a report in 1912 of four patients he worked with, with what he described as struma lymphomatosa. 
And that was basically hypothyroidism uh, without iodine deficiency. These patients were iodine replete, and uh, but the thyroids were infiltrated with lymphocytes. And so this was uh, recognized as another cause of hypothyroidism. And uh, in 1957, it was recognized that this was an autoimmune disease. Um, the clinical presentation, usually in the early stages, patients, again, could be euthyroid or subclinical. Um, so again, subclinical, TSH, usually I'm going to use just the range 4.5. Again, 4.2 technically would be the, um, the, the range there, uh, but 4.5 milli international units per liter. So above that, with a normal free T4, maybe free T3, uh, with elevated uh, antibodies. So that would be the subclinical. And uh, so that might be an early stage. Unfortunately, about 10 to 15 percent of patients who turn out to have Hashimoto's um, actually um, are antibody negative, at least in the early phases. Um, and we'll see that that's because the damage is happening to the uh, thyroid. It's not primarily from the antibodies. It's from the T cells. Um, and uh, so it could be that they cause their damage before any antibodies are elevated. Later stages, we might see the non-tender goiter. Uh, again, it's more uniform, no gross nodules. Um, that said, if you compare it to Graves, which is very smooth and diffuse, uh, Hashimoto's can be a little bit more irregular and nodular. So there's a slight difference in the goiters between Hashimoto's and Graves' disease. But the, ta the uh, capsule remains intact around the thyroid. Uh, as the goiter enlarges, it can compress local structures like the recurrent laryngeal nerve causing hoarseness, uh, thyroid arteries causing bruise, and then the esophagus causing dysphagia. Um, so we probably want to get an ultrasound in those cases to see uh, what the extent of the compression might be. And then over time, there's gradual loss of the thyroid as it becomes replaced by scar tissue and um, all of that. We'll go through that uh, pathophysiology here in just a moment. Um, and we can actually get episodes of transient hyperthyroidism where pockets of thyroid begin to hypersecrete, but then over time, it all sort of dies down into hypothyroidism. So typical progression is euthyroid to subclinical to hypothyroidism. Um, that said, there have been many cases of spontaneous resolution where suddenly the autoimmune process stops, thyroid goes back to normal function. And um, I found clinically if we correct a lot of the stressors on the immune system, which I'll talk about here, uh, this, there might be a better chance of that actually occurring. So in terms of the pathophysiology of uh, Hashimoto's, again, this is autoimmune. Uh, we do find it associated with other autoimmune diseases, so patients with Hashimoto's should be really screened for a lot of these others, including type 1 diabetes, uh, celiac disease, uh, pernicious anemia with a B12 deficiency, uh, vitiligo, um, Addison's disease, which is the autoimmune destruction of the adrenal gland. Uh, that causes true adrenal fatigue. We'll talk about that later, but true adrenal fatigue is not what people in the clinic call adrenal fatigue, which is more what we're now calling HPA axis dysregulation. The adrenals are totally fine and intact in those patients. In Addison's, the immune system actually destroys the adrenals. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and so forth. So all of those might be something to have on your radar whenever you have a newly diagnosed Hashimoto patient. Uh, most cases we think are Th1, potentially Th17 predominant. That said, uh, in later stages, we might see some components of Th2 as well. So remember, Th1, Th17 is your classic uh, kind of active inflammation, um, uh, autoimmune inflammation, whereas Th2 is more related to allergy. Um, this is a type 4 hypersensitivity. Remember, hypersensitivities, type 1 is allergy, type 2 and 3 we often see in autoimmune, but type 4 is delayed hypersensitivity, and that involves uh, CD4 cells that secrete TNF-alpha, IL-12, interferon gamma, IL-18, and that all upregulates the cytotoxic T cells, CD8 cells. Those cells then migrate into the thyroid, and then they cause local destruction. Um, once they're there, they secrete their cytokines, macrophages join the show, they secrete IL-1, TNF-alpha, uh, and then uh, we can measure a lot of these cytokines in the thyroid, causes further recruitment of immune cells, and the process just perpetuates. Um, now, um, as I said, in the later stages, what we start to see is this, the Th2 cells, the CD4 cells, um, come into play, and they secrete IL-4, 5, and 10, and that upregulates the B cells, and now we get the IgG 
uh, as well as some IgE, but mostly IgG antibodies. So this is um, the type 4 hypersensitivity. Type 2 hypersensitivity would be associated more with the direct antibodies. Um, so we have antibodies that are directed. Remember in a type 2, this is cytotoxic sensitivity. We have, uh, you know, let's say thyroid peroxidase on the cell, TPO. The immune system now creates antibodies against thyroid peroxidase, and it binds and destroys, usually causes an antigen antibody complex on the surface of the cell membrane, and that then will trigger, um, auto, you know, maybe autolysis of the cell and so forth. Uh, so this is a type 2 hypersensitivity, and that's where we start to see the antibodies, the TPO antibody, uh, the antithyroglobulin, and so forth. Rarely we see thyroid TSH receptor blocking antibodies as well, but those are not typically measured. Those are more common in what's called atrophic thyroiditis. And that's where we get, it's kind of like Hashimoto's, but instead of goiter, the gland shrinks over time um, because the TSH is, isn't able to stimulate and cause hyperproliferation at the receptor. Um, again, 10 to 15% of patients may be antibody negative, so this branch maybe doesn't turn on as quickly as the type 4 hypersensitivity. Um, as I mentioned before, being euthyroid with the antibodies, person is at greater risk of progressing to overt hypothyroidism. Um, most of the destruction in the gland we think is from the first type, the type 4 hypersensitivity and the CD8 cells. Some evidence is that the antibodies themselves cause damage to the gland. But kind of the thinking is that the antibodies aren't causing the primary amount of damage to the thyroid. So they, it's hard to utilize those as a way of tracking the amount of destruction and inflammation in the thyroid. So this is why, going back to the lab testing, serial antibody testing is probably not going to be accurately tracking uh, thyroid destruction. Um, the other big thing we see in autoimmune disease, of course, is a downregulation of your regulatory T cells. And so that's probably the most significant aspect here. It's like not T, that it's Th1 or Th2, but that the Th3 or regulatory T cell activity is downregulated. And then finally, we see a depletion of the antioxidants like glutathione and superoxide dismutase inside of the thyroid um, in um, uh, autoimmune thyroiditis. So one of the strategies clinically will be to try to upregulate uh, glutathione production to help protect the thyroid from further damage. So that's a little of the pathophysiology of what actually happens to cause destruction within the thyroid gland. So if you do a biopsy of thyroid tissue, which is not typically done in the case of Hashimoto's unless uh, there are uh, nodules, um, but typically we would find um, that the parenchyma become infiltrated by lymphocytes. Um, and uh, these would be, of course, the T, the, usually the CD8 T cells, uh, together with macrophages and uh, some of the dendritic cells, which are antigen presenting. And these form, we also see uh, lymphoid follicles composed of B cells, uh, those antibody secreting B cells, also accumulate within the thyroid. So here in the picture, the, the slide to the right, um, you can see the thyroid follicles. There's a colloid. Here's another one. Um, and here you see these big pockets of lymphocytes that sort of uh, collect within the thyroid itself. Over time, that causes all that local inflammation with all the cytokines and whatnot, causes atrophy of the follicular cells, and they actually undergo a change. Um, they undergo metaplasia into what are called Hurtley cells. This is kind of a bored question. What are Hurtley cells? These are folli thyroid follicular cells that have undergone metaplastic change due to the uh, inflammation in the thyroid, and they're found in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, the cytoplasm becomes very granular, almost eosinophilic looking. Um, and then finally, there's uh, fibrosis, stromal fibrosis, with a gradual enlargement and then destruction of the gland. So over time, the gland itself uh, becomes destroyed. So that's the kind of at the gross histology level as to what's happening there. Now, what are some of the causes of Hashimoto's? Well, the list is huge. Um, so we think that we need a genetic first hit. In other words, there have to be certain genetic uh, uh, predispositions. We do find a high correlation in monozygotic twins, well over 50%. Uh, and there's a connection with HLA-DR5. Um, there's also different polymorphisms with uh, T-cell activity and so forth. And we think it might be potentially on the X chromosome. 
Um, but these, uh, this is sort of the first thing that has to be in place. So there has to be a genetic susceptibility. But having that susceptibility isn't enough. And as I mentioned in the Sicily study, showing that the rate of Hashimoto's is dramatically increasing over three decades suggests that there are other factors. Um, so we are suspecting environmental toxins. And there are a lot of agents that we, uh, some research has been done on, um, including organochloride pesticides, PCBs, bisphenol A, which is a plasticizer, perchlorate, which is in the rocket fuel, but now it's in the food supply, uh, triclosan, which is in the antibacterial soaps. I think that's been largely taken off the market by the FDA, um, but you know, that was one of those antibacterial hand soap ingredients. Uh, different metals like cadmium, lithium, and copper that accumulate. Now, copper is interesting. We'll see it actually has a role in very, very low dose homeopathic dosages uh, in the treatment of hyperthyroidism, but in hypo, we can accentuate. Copper really, we can think of is, uh, it uh, has different effects on physiology. It actually increases estrogen and it decreases thyroid hormone. Um, so we can think of, again, estrogen as sort of having a negative effect on thyroid. Uh, interestingly, progesterone, uh, as well as androgens, uh, so like DHEA and different antigens, um, actually increase thyroid hormone. Um, so that has a more of a stimulatory effect. But copper, we can think is sort of mimicking the estrogen process. Uh, I mentioned different halogens like uh, fluorine and chlorine and bromine. These would all be, again, potential environmental agents which are impacting the thyroid. Um, chronic infection, so there's a theory out there that uh, Epstein-Barr virus is a major cause of Hashimoto's. Um, but uh, like any other viral cause, we always have to ask this question, is it the virus? Again, over 80% of the world is infected with Epstein-Barr. So is it the virus itself or is it more other conditions in the tissue which makes it more susceptible to the virus and uh, brings about that whole inflammatory process? You know, we can't really control viruses, but we can really, as clinicians, we can help support the patient's gland and the terrain of the gland uh, for proper function. Uh, different drugs, medications we know impact the thyroid, amiodarone, uh, I mentioned the antiarrhythmic drug, contains iodine, uh, lithium, interferons, uh, antidepressants, especially the, I mentioned fluoxetine, Prozac has fluorine, uh, tricyclics, but beta blockers. Beta blockers, by blocking the alpha, uh, the beta adrenergic system, are really kind of down-regulating the sympathetic system, and so that, uh, remember, sympathetics kind of support the whole thyroid activity. Uh, we should mention centrally acting alpha blockers would also, uh, like prazosin and whatnot, could potentially do that as well. Uh, phenytoin, um, anti-epileptic, anti and then statins might worsen myopathy in uh, hypothyroid patients. I put a question mark there because I haven't seen any real confirmatory uh, clinical evidence for that, but that's a theory. Uh, cigarette smoking theocyanide in cigarette inhibits iodine uptake. Uh, so over time, that could impact the thyroid's ability to make hormone. Um, interestingly, though, usually cigarette smoking for the type 1 hypersensitivities uh, tends to uh, downregulate the immune response, interestingly. So the risk of Hashimoto's actually dramatically increases in the months following smoking cessation. So that, so that shouldn't discourage us from having, you know, talking about smoking cessation with patients, but just be aware of that. Um, different things in the diet, so lots of chronic alcoholism. Now, there's theories, of course, that goitrogens can inhibit thyroid, so a lot of the brassicas, legumes, soy, soy is more estrogenic. Um, these uh, theocyanates uh, or the, um, the glucosinolates, the sulfur compounds, sorry, in brassicas are thought to inhibit the thyroid. That came out of looking at, for example, that was first noticed in cattle who were grazing all day long on fields of, of uh, brassica uh, plants that they were developing hypothyroidism. Um, it turns out you'd have to eat a lot of goitrogens to really inhibit the thyroid. In fact, if you steam those foods, uh, it pretty much neutralizes the glucosinolates. So I think the benefits of goitrogenic foods eaten in the right context, the right amount with steaming, the nutrients and other benefits are gonna far outweigh any potential thyroid uh, negative uh, effects. So just keep that in mind clinically that we shouldn't just do a blanket statement of eliminating those foods uh, without looking at how much is being eaten and how they've been prepared. 
Um, gluten, we do know, uh, I mentioned the correlation with uh, Hashimoto's and celiac disease. Um, and uh, so there does seem to be a higher incidence there. Unfortunately, as I'll talk about in the treatment section, removing gluten from the diet does not seem to improve Hashimoto's. Now, I have heard anecdotal stories of that from patients where it completely heals, you know, it, it reduced my need for thyroid hormone, et cetera, et cetera. They're also doing a lot of other things, so it's hard to say if it was the gluten elimination. I've had other patients who have done that and didn't make one bit of a difference. Um, so again, most people with they, that suspect they have gluten intolerance, that's not the same as celiac disease. In celiac, you actually have to remove gluten um, to prevent that immune reaction. We're finding that a lot of people with gluten intolerance actually are not intolerant to gluten, but to the complex carbohydrates, the starches in modern grain. And especially if you couple that with glyphosate and, uh, and the fact that a lot of modern grain has been engineered to be resistant to fungi and moisture and whatnot, the starches are really hard to break down. So a lot of people don't secrete adequate amylase and so forth to really do that. Um, especially if you're stressed, you're gonna have less pancreatic output, things like that. Um, so you're gonna be more susceptible to getting bloating and gas from your grains, from bacterial fermentation, taking over the job of what your pancreas should have done. Uh, but it's not from the gluten, it's from the starches. So, you know, we have to be a little clear about that, but I think a lot of people do find benefit from eliminating a lot of modern grain from the diet and uh, they feel better at least in their digestive system. Um, and then different micronutrient deficiencies might contribute like selenium I mentioned, zinc, iodine, uh, vitamin D, I should mention vitamin A, remember that's part of the uh, the um, hormone response element on DNA, part of the, TS, the thyroid hormone receptor, and then B12 and iron. So these would all be potential thyroid supporting nutrients. Um, whether or not, again, that causes Hashimoto's, that's a whole different story if any of those are implicated. Uh, we do know that the risk goes up with age in both males and females, again, until 70, then it declines again. Uh, increases with pregnancy, and then there are different neuroendocrine factors. So definitely st having higher stress hormones will have a lot of effects of how thyroid, not just Hashimoto's, but that could number one, trigger autoimmunity, but also impact the ability of T4 to be converted to T3 in the tissues. Because remember the glucocorticoids inhibit the type three diiodinase. And then uh, sex hormones, high estrogen I mentioned, low androgens and progesterone, that all can contribute. Uh, having mitochondrial dysfunction. So again, the end point of thyroid metabolism really is to upregulate mitochondrial activity. So if any of those mitochondrial uh, cytochromes or electron transport chain and whatnot are not properly functioning, uh, we might see what appears to be symptoms of hypothyroidism. Again, I wanna focus the discussion here on Hashimoto. So really we're, we're looking more at the fact that the the, the reason the thyroid is going low is because of the autoimmune destruction, not because of any of these nutrient deficiencies and so forth. Uh, systemic inflammation can make it worse, and especially with uh, low glutathione, uh, we're gonna, again, have more damage within the thyroid gland. And then uh, we might see liver disorders, fatty liver, cholestasis. Again, in terms of just looking at thyroid function, there's some estimates that up to 30% of your plasma free T3 is from liver conversion of T4. So if that's contributing a pretty large pool of T3 into the blood and if there's any problem in the liver with conversion, then we might start to see issues of hypothyroidism manifesting as well. So that's some of the basic etiology, mostly of Hashimoto's. It, this could apply to just low thyroid states in general, uh, but that these would all be kind of things to think about. This is not all things we can control. And as clinicians, of course, um, we have some modifiable things. We can certainly help the patients with their neuroendocrine factors. We can look at the medications. We can look at the diet and cigarette smoking, things like that. But you know, we pretty much, it's difficult to completely avoid the environmental toxicity at this point. And um, so we can't live in bubbles. And, and so in a way, being out in the world, you're gonna be exposed to this. And the question is, how do we improve the inner resistance to these factors to make a person less susceptible? So with Hashimoto's, the prognosis is generally considered good. If uh, from the biomedical angle, really the treatment is aimed at uh, restoring T4 levels and uh, TSH, uh, keeping that in the normal range. 
Um, if we don't properly treat Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, this could lead to the uh, myxedema, this could lead to the myxedema coma, and that is a very poor prognosis and a very high mortality rate. Um, other complications you see would be persistent, obviously, hypothyroid symptoms. And uh, with that, we might see dyslipidemias with the increased uh, cardiovascular risk, uh, and then cardiovascular disease like coronary artery disease, even heart failure uh, because of the need for the heart for thyroid hormone, severe depression, and then all the other issues that I discussed around thyroid physiology, we might see symptoms in a lot of different areas. Uh, as I mentioned in Hashimoto's, there can be transient periods of hyperthyroidism, um, but this does not progress typically into graves uh, with the orbitopathy, the, the exothalmos. Um, and it's usually transient, it goes right back into hypo over time. Um, thyroid enlargement, obviously, the goiter, that might result in severe compression. That's going to be usually treated with corticosteroids and surgery. Uh, now, there is a risk, unfortunately, with uh, Hashimoto's of two different types of cancer. That would be primary B-cell lymphoma. And that affects less than one in a thousand patients, uh, but the risk increases with long-standing thyroiditis. So that's B-cell lymphoma, and that uh, also thyroid cancer, uh, especially in what we call, there are four different types of thyroid cancers. The one with the best prognosis, the one that is what we call most differentiated, would be the papillary thyroid cancers. And Hashimoto's is more associated with those. Um, and uh, interestingly, we find the risk is increased only in the euthyroid subjects, but not in those with hypothyroidism. So one idea there is that the hypothyroidism actually protects you from the cancer. And uh, we don't know if thyroid uh, replacement therapy and so forth increases that risk. But, um, you know, we usually just go ahead and treat the thyroid in either case. Um, seems like the anti-TPO antibody might actually protect against the thyroid cancer. Uh, so that's a little bit of a twist where there's maybe a positive aspect to those antibodies. Um, but this is something we're always looking out for. And, you know, usually when we see especially nodules pop up in the thyroid, I'll talk all about the assessment for that. Uh, we might see a patient with Hashimoto's develop thyroid nodules, and we're going to want to properly assess those to rule out the possibility of uh, any thyroid cancer. And then the, again, medical emergency would be the myxedema coma. That's going to be uh, end stage of untreated hypothyroidism. Uh, the most common presentation here would be like an elderly person uh, who has not been diagnosed before, maybe in a nursing home, and uh, they start developing progressive weakness and stupor, or hypothermia. Uh, hypoventilation, their blood sugar drops, and they get hyponatremic, low sodium. The body temperature drops as low as 75 degrees Fahrenheit, core temperature, and that can result in shock and death. So this has a very high mortality rate, over 50%. Um, so that older patient may be living alone at home, uh, heating's not so good, the winter comes around, and uh, there might be underlying pulmonary disease. That's going to be the person most susceptible to myxedema coma. So those would be some of the main complications of uh, Hashimoto's in particular. So I mentioned one of the subtypes of Hashimoto's is postpartum thyroiditis. Um, it affects about five to, uh, five to 10% of um, uh, women in pregnancy and occurs within the first year after delivery. Uh, and what we find is elevated anti-TPO and anti-thyroglobulin antibodies uh, so you actually, and, and signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. Um, so we can't actually distinguish uh, this from Hashimoto's if you just did like a biopsy of the, of the thyroid. It looks almost identical to Hashimoto's. The course typically is, uh, the initial presentation is actually hyperthyroid. So there's a transient thyroid toxicosis. Usually that's within one to four months after delivery. And that lasts for one to three months. That's followed by hypothyroidism, which then um, can last up to a year or more. And then usually by a year to 18 months, it resolves. Uh, now, if a person continues to be hypothyroid after a year, then we usually just use the label Hashimoto's and we say that the pregnancy kind of unmasked the Hashimoto. So this is more of a technical kind of definition, but the treatment for postpartum is gonna be different than typical Hashimoto's in that first year. Um, about a third of patients will go through both of those phases, thyrotoxicosis and then hypothyroidism. 
a third only will have either the thyroid toxicosis or the hypothyroid phases, and then 20% that go into the hypothyroid phase will remain hypothyroid, uh, and then we sort of address that like we would address Hashimoto's. Um, the risk is having other autoimmune disease, like a history of type 1 diabetes, celiac, etc. Um, having positive antithyroid antibodies before the pregnancy. Um, so the higher the antibodies, the higher the risk. Um, any history of previous thyroid dysfunction, uh, history of previous postpartum thyroiditis. Um, so if uh, this was a second or third uh, pregnancy, uh, about 20% of those patients will have a recurrence. And then any family history of thyroid dysfunction. Um, now, a lot of autoimmune diseases, because of the high um, estriol and progesterone, will actually improve during pregnancy. Um, but again, those hormones are dropping postpartum, so we're going to see a flare-up of any autoimmune disease or maybe masked autoimmune disease that now becomes symptomatic. Uh, the treatment for the thyroid toxicosis phase is primarily with beta blockers only because this is transient and um, it will... Uh, resolve. And so the antithyroid medications we'll talk about, like the methimazole and propothiouracil, are not typically given for postpartum uh, thyroid toxicosis. Um, the hypothyroidism is treated with thyroid replacement therapy if needed. Uh, but again, many of these cases will resolve after a year. And so we'd need then to taper off the thyroid meds uh, as necessary. So that's uh, postpartum thyroiditis, uh, you know, pretty common, so we should be able to recognize that in our postpartum patients. Obviously, remember that depression is an enormous, uh, low thyroid is an enormous risk factor for depression. So uh, this is going to be important to consider in patients with postpartum depression. Are they also having any degree of postpartum uh, hypothyroidism? So in terms of assessment for Hashimoto's, we look at our history and physical exams, so any signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. Uh, do a full uh, HENT exam with uh, neck and thyroid, uh, heart, lung, usually abdominal, and we're going to check reflexes. That would all be part of the typical initial physical exam. Uh, standard labs would be just, you know, your complete blood count, complete metabolic panel, your lipid panel, A1C, if these have not been done uh, previously. But then our main test will be TSH. And again, according to the guideline committees, we actually, for screening, just do TSH first. And then uh, if that is elevated uh, or low, then, you know, suggesting hyperthyroidism, then we're going to uh, get a free T4 as well. Uh, currently, again, there's no real indication for free T3, again, because it's not a very accurate biomarker. Uh, that statement, of course, is going to be controversial in the functional medicine naturopathic circles, but that's what the current stance is by the guideline committees. Uh, the thyroid autoantibodies, anti-TPO and thyroglobulin, will be our main antibodies. Um, and reverse T3, together with a free T3, really are not recommended as uh, definitely not for screening tools and uh, usually not for any sort of uh, thyroid workup. Uh, with the exception of hyperthyroidism, again, we have a role for using free T3 there. Um, imaging, we usually don't order ultrasound for our patients with Hashimoto's unless we palpate nodules or, or see a goiter, or palpate a goiter. Um, so that could give us further information there. If nodules are present and the patient is euthyroid or hypothyroid, then we might need to think about um, giving an ultrasound-guided biopsy. Uh, if the patient is hyperthyroid, that would suggest a toxic or hot nodule, and they're gonna get the radioactive iodine uptake test and um, uh, scan. Um, and so we're going to, uh, you know, kind of differentiate the different uh, nodules based on the thyroid values. Okay, so in terms of thyroid ranges and treatment, I just want to kind of go over that because there seems to be a lot of controversy still about who actually needs thyroid hormone replacement and so forth. Um, thyroid again, means normal TSH and normal free T4, and I'm using the... Um, uh, AACE and ATA guidelines here in terms of TSH, free T4. Again, there's some controversy. Should the upper TS range be at 2, uh, not at 4.2 4 or 4.5? Um, and so there's this question between TSH of 2 and 4.5. Um, according to the current guidelines, that person is euthyroid, but some say that's actually an elevated thyroid, and that could suggest primary hypothyroidism. 
Uh, I'll just say that studies have looked at giving thyroid hormone supplementation in that uh, range, and it has not resulted in any difference in the clinical presentation or outcomes of the patients. So uh, currently, it's not thought that we should be giving thyroid hormone in that range. But for you thyroid patients in general with no elevated antibodies, um, thyroid replacement is not indicated. So if they're having hypothyroid symptoms, and we might call that functional, so this is not a biomedical diagnosis, but some patients come in, they feel cold, they have a low basal body temperature, they might even have other hypothyroid symptoms, dry skin, constipation, but their TSH is normal, free T4 is normal. The committees are pretty clear on this, thyroid replacement should not be used. And from a naturopathic, Chinese medicine, functional medicine angle, we can say really what we need to treat there is any other endocrine imbalances. So if they have lots of stress hormones, HPA axis dysregulation, if there's liver imbalances uh, and so forth, all of that should be addressed uh, with our you know, different therapies, nutrition, with uh, exercise, with uh, herbal therapies, uh, acupuncture and so forth. That's really the place to start before giving any thyroid replacement therapy because there again, you might risk over medicating. Now, if they're only elevated antibodies, so a person is you know, euthyroid, normal TSH, free T4, uh, normal antibodies, Again, thyroid replacement therapy is not indicated, but these patients should be monitored because about 5-10% can progress the hypothyroidism um, per year. So they should be maybe yearly monitored with their TSH, free T4, and of course at that point initiate any factors that might uh, you know, predispose them to autoimmune disease. Uh, subclinical would be elevated TSH above the 4.5. I'm using 4.5. Remember the guidelines really use 4.2. Um, a lot of labs use the 4.5 range, so I'm just kind of rounding up there, but we could technically use 4.2 as our upper range. Uh, but subclinical would be elevated TSH above the normal range, normal free T4, and normal or elevated antibodies. Um, the question is, do you uh, give thyroid hormone there? And the studies have really suggested uh, no benefit unless the TSH is over 10. So if the free T4 is normal, TSH is over 10, Maybe there's some role for thyroid replacement therapy in that case. Again, I would address all the risk factors, and we'll talk about that um, first, and then maybe assess and see where that brings the thyroid before starting hormone replacement therapy. Uh, primary hypothyroidism would be elevated TSH, low free T4. And uh, again, if it's Hashimoto's, we're going to see maybe elevated, usually elevated antibodies, um, but it might be normal if it's another cause. Um, thyroid replacement therapy is indicated. Um, to bring the TSH down, and I'll talk about what the TSH goal is on levothyroxine replacement in just a moment. And then central hypothyroidism, low TSH, low free T4, normal antibodies, and here we treat the uh, pituitary and hypothalamus uh, and look for you know pituitary adenomas or anything else that might be contributing to that. Um, but in this case, um, we would um, also probably want to give, if we can't solve the pituitary problem, uh, give the thyroid replacement therapy in those cases. Now, finally, there is that sick euthyroid syndrome, also called non-thyroidal illness syndrome, and that's uh, TSH slightly decreased or normal, uh, maybe normal or slightly decreased free T4, free T3, but the big thing is increased reverse T3, which is inactive, no antibodies, uh, we have pretty clear evidence that thyroid replacement is not indicated in those cases. You need to correct the underlying illness, the problem that's contributing to the elevated cytokines and cortisol and so forth. So that's a, it's a lot, but it can be confusing, and especially in functional medicine circles, we often see thyroid hormone being given for a lot more patients than what I've just indicated here. And so that's always something to keep in the back of your mind is, am I over-medicating with this patient? Are there other ways that we can use to support this patient's thyroid process beyond just giving thyroid replacement therapy? So here's the overview of treatment for Hashimoto's. Our goals will be to correct low thyroid levels uh, with the replacement therapy as ne if necessary. To, and that's as far really as the biomedical approach usually goes. The second approach would be to think about how do we address autoimmunity? And then how do we address any particular constitutional symptoms the person might be having? Um, so those would be kind of our three treatment areas. Um, now the range of TSH in the clinical picture, again, is going to determine which step 
which level of the therapeutic order to start at. Um, so for our euthyroid patients with symptoms, we're gonna probably, we're gonna start at level one and level two, and I'll review these levels here in just a moment. With our uh, uh, subclinical patients, again, we'll start at level one and two first, and then kind of reassess over time to see what's happened. For the overt hypothyroidism, TSH over 10, we definitely start at level three replacement therapy. That's pretty clear. Um, TSH between five or you know, four, 4.5 and 10. Um, with the elevated antibodies, usually we start with replacement therapy as well. Um, I've seen some physicians really wait until the TSH go up to 10 before they recommend any thyroid therapy. Remember, there's a lot of factors on TSH. It's going to be fluctuating. Even in a single day, it'll fluctuate up to 50% and um, time of the year and things like that. So a single TSH reading can be sometimes a little confusing. And um, so that's why, you know, there's some range there. So anything under 10, uh, again, if a person's only mildly symptomatic, some physicians might say, oh, let's just wait and see if some of the other level one, level two therapies we do might actually correct the thyroid before giving any replacement. Uh, generally, we check the TSH um, after starting any replacement therapy every four to eight weeks until the proper dosage of the hormones is attained. So our TSH target in non-pregnant adults is going to be between 0.3 and 3 milli international units per liter. In pregnancy, uh, it's going to be less than 2.5. And uh, again, some of the guidelines suggest that in the first trimester, we should be looking at maybe keeping it under 2. Again, in functional medicine circles, I see a lot of people recommending upper range of TSH of two, um, but that's pretty controversial. And again, correcting it that closely, could that actually over time lead to thyroid toxicosis in some patients? Uh, so just be careful about that. Once an optimal range is reached with the medications, the TSH is rechecked every six to 12 months. That's pretty typical. So here's our typical therapeutic order. Again, level one would be just conditions for health. So that would include diet, uh, exercise, uh, lifestyle, and stress reduction techniques. Level two would be addressing salutogenesis, which is the forces that support homeostasis and terrain. The, for, you know, really conditions that support health. Um, so that would be addressing autoimmunity, supporting the thyroid directly, supporting the T4 to T3 conversion, supporting mitochondria, supporting the neuroendocrine system, and then organ systems. And we do that through the different micronutrient therapies. We have herbal therapy, potentially glandular therapy. Glandular therapy is uh, usually bovine or porcine glands where the hormones have been removed. Um, so there is no hormone in there, but it contains all of the nutrients, uh, and cofactors and whatnot that are necessary for the gland to properly function. So that's glandular therapy. That's different than hormone replacement therapy. Uh, homeopathy, again, uh, we can think of homeopathy under Avogadro's number, so less than 24X or less than 12C. Those remedies are really still, there is physiologic amounts of remedy in there. Remember, many of our hormones are actually in, for example, the 9X up to maybe 12X dilution. Um, so homeopathy under Avogadro's number um, is going to be useful for supporting physiology. It's really mimicking the dosage that the cells are used to seeing. So um, this would be uh, a salutogenic therapy to support physiologic terrain. Acumoxotherapy, uh, lots of evidence now that acupuncture, amongst many things, is altering the autonomic nervous system and really affecting the way different organs and glands are functioning. So we can have benefits there. Physical medicine might be useful. Light and sound therapy, uh, pulse electromagnetic field therapy, these are more uh, kind of controversial in some areas, but uh, we do have good data coming now with light uh, with a lot of uh, effects on downregulating uh, pain, inflammation, and so forth. Um, there's an interesting emerging therapy looking at how we can tap into the vagus nerve to downregulate autoimmunity. So vagal nerve stimulators and whatnot. Again, we could probably get the same effects with acupuncture or the pulse electromagnetic fields, which are non-invasive. Um, we can also think about going deeper, and I won't dwell on that here, but supporting in patients their psychological terrain as well. So not just the physiologic terrain. And that would be using uh, homeopathy and the higher potencies above Avogadro's number, uh, flower essences, cognitive behavioral therapy, counseling, and so forth. And then supporting what we might call the mental spiritual terrain, which would be mindfulness, meditation, 
art, music, movement therapy, biography work, and so forth. So those would be level two therapies. Jumping back to level one, you know, some of the basic guidelines we might think about for Hashimoto's would be our healthy diet. So limiting processed foods, overly salted foods, um, uh, looking at limiting trans fats, too much saturated fat, uh, increasing vegetables, increasing good nuts and seeds, good oils, uh, making sure we're getting adequate selenium, iodine, so forth in the diet. Uh, potential gluten and goitrogen reduction, again, you know, we have to also say that these foods have a lot of health benefits, so we don't want to take away too many of those foods, but maybe think about steaming or cooking the foods first. Um, so those would be some of the basic dietary guidelines we find that are helpful in Hashimoto's. Um, exercise would be, you know, encouraging, this is more just for general cardiovascular health, the kind of guidelines are about 30 minutes of moderately vigorous exercise up to five times a week. If you're doing more strenuous exercise, 20 minutes at least. Uh, three times a week, uh, usually a mixture of aerobic and anaerobic. Um, we do know that aerobic exercise increases the sensitivity of peripheral tissues to T4, and it also increases the activity of the diiodinases type 1 and type 2, so we're going to get better conversion of thyroid. Uh, sleep hygiene, well, we know melatonin actually can support proper thyroid function, so good sleep, decreasing alcohol, eliminating uh, cigarette smoking, but again, remember there might be with some patients an increased uptick of their autoimmunity in the months following smoking cessation. Uh, looking at maybe uh, are they swimming every day in a chlorinated pool or uh, things like that, you know, looking at their chlorine, their, their halogen intake. Um, stress reduction, mindfulness practice, and you know, yoga, tai chi, qigong based on the patient's preferences. So that would be level one and level two therapies. Level four therapies, I'll just skip ahead to that here, would be addressing pathogenesis directly, suppressing inflammation, uh, you know, everything when we use the word anti. So anti this, anti that, that would be level four. Usually that's not gonna be indicated for Hashimoto's. Um, the main, again, biomedical approach, if indicated, will be the thyroid replacement therapy. And that's gonna be usually starting with levothyroxine, LT4, usually starting at 50 to 75 micrograms a day. Uh, monitoring every four to eight weeks your TSH, and then uh, going no higher than 200 micrograms a day with LT4. Now LT4 is generic, but it also comes in brand names like Synthroid and whatnot. They all have unfortunately different binders and fillers, and so I have seen patients react differently, and so we have to be clear if we're gonna switch between classes of uh, levothyroxine, we're probably gonna need to readjust the dosage and, and monitor that patient. Um, Leothyronine, LT3, or Cytomel, um, can be an adjunct agent, and I'll talk about that here. The patients who don't respond after three to six months to LT4, in other words, you get their TSH in the normal range, um, but their maybe T4 is still hovering low and they're symptomatic, there is a role for adding in a little LT3, usually five micrograms, one to two times a day. Um, the guideline committee suggests that that's okay to do, and then just monitor if there's no improvement in three months, then just don't keep doing it. Uh, just take it out. Um, so that's the typical way that endocrinologists will kind of do that. Uh, again, I've seen a lot of naturopaths kind of do compounding. This has become popular to compound LT4, LT3, and um, give that to the patient. Um, you're, again, with any sort of T3 therapy, going to risk run the risk of thyroid toxicosis because the cells will immediately get stimulated with that. And a lot of patients will at first feel really good. They feel really energized and whatnot. Um, but that's the same thing with giving any stimulant. You're gonna feel over stimulated. You're gonna feel stimulated, you're gonna feel good. But over time, you get a lessening of benefit and uh, you start to see more symptoms. Um, the other form of replacement therapy would be the natural desiccated thyroid, NDT. And I'll talk about that here shortly. That would be like Armour Thyroid or Nature Thyroid. That's usually from pig thyroid. They actually take the whole gland. They don't remove the hormones. Uh, they do some degree of standardization of T4 to T3 in there. There's also iodine. Unfortunately, there's also pig peptides. And uh, one theory is that those could actually be antigenic in people who are uh, susceptible. So in other words, if you have a pre-existing autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's, taking those pig peptides might cause more reactions. So because of that, and because of the poor standardization, uh, batch to batch, you're gonna inevitably have some variability. The uh, 
kind of guideline committees, American Thyroid Association and whatnot, uh, really say that we, they're really kind of frown on the use of natural desiccated thyroid. That said, a lot of patients feel a lot more benefit from this than they do from the LT4 and LT3. So we, you know, as clinicians, we always have to find what works best for the patient, not what some guideline committee says. But um, this would be something to, you know, try in patients who maybe are not responsive to the other medications. Okay, so that's an overview of the treatment approaches, and now we'll delve into each of these in more detail and kind of explore how to think about that. So I'm gonna start here first with the level three therapies, the thyroid, the, um, thyroid replacement therapy. So again, we usually uh, think about treating when the TSH gets elevated, so definitely uh, above 10, but maybe above 4.5 with a low free T4. Uh, in pregnancy, uh, we're gonna look at anything above 2.5 as indicating the need for thyroid replacement. Um, again, the, uh, without a low free T4, if the free T4 is normal, it's more controversial if some clinical hypothyroidism should be treated with thyroid replacement therapy first. Uh, not indicated for any euthyroid states. Again, unless in pregnancy, uh, if you have a TSH of let's say four and your free T4 is uh, in the normal range but low, normal, uh, then you might want to think about giving some thyroid to get the TSH below 2.5. Uh, so our different forms here of thyroid will be again Levo, um, and there's different brands, again it's generic, but uh, it also goes by the brand names of Lavoxyl or Synthroid. Um, in non-pregnant adults under 65, we're going to use usually start with a low dose, 25, 50, maybe up to 75. Um, typically anywhere between 50 and 100 micrograms is going to be our starting dose and uh, we're going to measure that TSH every four to eight weeks, usually every four weeks, um, to get the TSH in the ranges that we want and the free T4 in the right range. Uh, we consider 200 micrograms the upper limit, so after that we don't go any higher. Now over 65 or with any cardiac disease, we start with a low dose, so 25 to 50 micrograms of uh, Olivo. Um, with TSH, we're going to reevaluate four weeks after initiating the treatment and adjust the dose by 25 micrograms as needed. So again, reach our target of TSH under three for non-pregnant adults and for pregnancy, uh, we're going to look at under 2.5. Now, leothyronine is going to be the cytomel, and again, there's going to be a place for that um, in selected cases with a poor response to T4. We're going to add that onto the T4 therapy. Uh, do a three-month trial of five micrograms of T3 twice a day, and then reduce the um, uh, Levo to about 40 micrograms, so bring that down, and then check the TSH after six weeks, um, and you want the TSH to be on the low to in normal range. If no response after three months, the ATA and AACE suggest don't uh, continue with the cytomel. Uh, now again, there are the sustained release forms, that's SRT3, and that is not recommended because of the high incidence of thyroid toxicosis and so forth. So I'll just leave that there. Again, this could be uh, you know, an area for further discussion, uh, especially in the functional medicine community, naturopathic community, but that's what the, the current kind of uh, guidelines indicate. Uh, natural desiccated thyroid, uh, there's again many types. The typical ones would be USP thyroid, armor thyroid, West thyroid, nature thyroid, the second two, I don't think we can get in the States currently. I've had patients order them from Canada, but USP thyroid is probably the, the most common. It's the least expensive, followed by armor. Uh, these contain both T4, about 80%, and T3, but not at the typical ratios that are secreted by the human thyroid. Pig thyroid is different. So one of the, uh, some of the critics of natural desiccated thyroid argue that the ratio doesn't mimic of T4 to T3, doesn't mimic what your uh, thyroid gland puts out. Um, so this is a, you know, lots of criticism about the natural desiccated thyroid, uh, but it's very commonly used in naturopathic functional medicine circles. A three month trial period is reasonable. So, you know, patients who maybe have tried the free T or the uh, LT4 and the T3 haven't responded well, uh, you know, it's reasonable to try the NDT, usually starting at a half a grain, uh, half a grain is equivalent to about 50 micrograms of LT4. Again, there's T3 in there, so uh, you can have some of those effects. Um, again, most endocrinologists and professional organizations uh, 
oppose the use of natural desiccated thyroid. Um, it should be the AACE, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. They argue that it's too rapidly absorbed, has too short a half-life, has the wrong T4 to T3 ratio, and has all sorts of other transient effects. Um, one grain, 60 milligrams, contains 38 micrograms of T4 and 9 micrograms of T3. So we say that equates to 100 micrograms of LT4. Again, a half a grain would be 50 micrograms. So that's one way to quickly estimate uh, in terms of conversion. Uh, NDT also contains about 0.2% iodine. So you can actually get a substantial amount of iodine uh, from taking that. And some people argue that might be further benefit is getting the iodine. And then uh, a lot of the fats are actually removed from the thyroid tissue. So uh, they do take some of the things out of the natural desiccated thyroid. The adult dose um, is again, between usually 90 and 100 milligrams, which would equate to 1.5 up to three grains. Uh, three grains is usually our upper limit there. Um, and uh, this is commonly used by NDs for a variety of reasons. I'll, I'll say I usually just stop at two grains. Uh, I think three might be the technical limit, but usually two is what our upper range should be. Um, and again, we gotta be careful, could this be triggering autoimmune thyroiditis? I did see one study on this and it suggested that taking armor actually, uh, by getting those antigens in the blood, it created a decoy for your immune system so that it attacked those antigens and not your thyroid. Um, so that's maybe a potentially protective role, but it's hard to predict that and we just sometimes just have to try it in our patients if, they're, if that's what they want to do. Um, going back to the testing, um, free T4, again, can be useful to monitor. Um, TSH, though, is considered more accurate as a serology level, so we're going to get a free T4 as sort of a baseline to see. Um, but unfortunately, we have a real inaccuracy with the LT4 therapy. So when you're on the levothyroxine for a couple of hours after taking it, um, the values are going to be falsely uh, elevated. They're not going to represent your baseline levels. And so we have to be careful about using free T4 there. Free T3 is not recommended except in uh, thyroid toxicosis because the levels fluctuate so widely. Again, the plasma levels of free T3 are not necessarily reflecting what's going on inside the cell, which is what we're really interested in. I, I have sometimes measured this. We have, uh, for example, at the clinic, in the NUNM clinic, we have um, you know, TSH test. If we want to get a free T4, it's actually less expensive to get the TSH, free T4, and free T3 all together. And this is their thyroid function test. So sometimes I'll just measure the package because it's less expensive. And the free T3 um, will show up. And um, you know, I've actually used that sometimes to kind of give me an estimate of what the liver is doing. Remember, the liver puts a big portion of the free T plasma uh, free T3 into circulation. Uh, reverse T3 is not recommended by the thyroid guidelines. And thyroid antibodies, we order at baseline and uh, but it's not recommended really to track those uh, because the antibody levels don't really correlate with the severity. A um, couple of features on thyroid uh, replacement therapy, low stomach acid and acids, acid blockers can all interfere with thyroid hormone absorption. So you have to really be careful about other medications patients are taking. In fact, we usually recommend they take their uh, thyroid away, at least an hour away from any other medications. Um, so they should be taken on an empty stomach and our three common dosing strategies would be in the morning, 60 minutes before the first meal. Second best would be 30 minutes before the first meal. And the or third would be the evening before bed, uh, more than two hours after dinner. And I find a lot of patients actually respond really well to this one. Um, so these are three potential dosing strategies. Uh, contraindications of therapy. Um, so diagnosed with untreated uh, adrenal insufficiency. And again, this is like Addison's, not the functional adrenal insufficiency that we talk about in functional medicine, naturopathic circles, um, because this will falsely elevate the TSH. Uh, myocardial infarction, patients with any arrhythmia, especially AFib, any signs of thyroid toxicosis, or of course, allergy to thyroid meds. And our overtreatment risks would be thyroid toxicosis, osteopenia, osteoporosis, AFib, and then dementia in the elderly. So, that's why we really want to kind of reserve uh, replacement therapy for those, those who need it. Okay, so that's an overview of the level three therapies, the replacement therapy. Now, level two therapies are, I think, are where functional medicine, naturopathic Chinese medicine can really help support 
um, Hashimoto's patients. Um, these are adjunctive therapies, but they can really address the neuroendocrine system, address salutogenesis, and that, you know, this is going to impact um, how severe autoimmunity might manifest. Um, the evidence for a lot of these are range from anecdotal to actual some clinical studies, so it varies. I didn't put all the sources here. That'd be a longer work to put all that together. Um, but that's something we can keep looking at in the literature to see uh, the evidence base there. In the literature, the dosages do vary, so it's hard to kind of say what the optimal dosage is, but I'll give you some guidelines here. So one aspect of level two would be supporting the neuroendocrine system, and that would be addressing different neuroendocrine patterns. For example, sympathetic dominance pattern is a very common one, high sympathetic tone with insomnia, anxiety, sweating, that sort of thing. And that's where our GABA agonists, L-theanine, zinc, uh, melatonin low dose, but also herbal nervines would all be potential uh, adjunctive agents there. Uh, an HPA axis or HPT axis dysregulation, this is more from the pituitary. Uh, this is where what we might call sedative adaptogens, herbs like ashwagandha, withania, and bacopa um, could be, uh, and holy basil could be useful agents there. Uh, magnolia bark, uh, a lot of these are in the products on the market that kind of manage excess cortisol uh, levels. Lithium in very small amounts, we're talking less than you know, four milligrams, not the high doses we're talking about in bipolar treatment and so forth, but also even in what's called an oligo element dose, and that's a one, 10 to the minus one dilution or one X dilution. Um, manganese as well, these have an ability to relax the cortisol access. Phosphatidylserine is another agent that can help with that. Um, Direct thyroid support, there are direct thyroid stimulating herbs. So obviously any kelp, bladderwrack, these contain iodine, uh, as well as other flavonoids and other uh, compounds that can help protect the thyroid against inflammation. Uh, the danger here would be over uh, uh, using a high dose and too much iodine. So remember the upper intake should be about 200 micrograms or so for non-pregnant adults uh, per day of iodine, so we'd have to kind of look at how much iodine a person might be getting. Uh, black cumin, nigella, sativa, this is popular in uh, the Middle East and uh, Egypt and all throughout uh, the Middle East and especially Unani medicine. Um, and this has actually a number of studies looking at um, nigella with Hashimoto's at dramatically decreasing the antibody levels and uh, all the different markers of inflammation. Um, nettle leaf, uh, coleus, Google, I just mentioned these, these have all kind of have different literature around them uh, with Hashimoto's as potential thyroid supporting agents. Some other patterns to, to think about would be what I'm calling here thymic dysregulation. Now this would be essentially uh, different uh, agents to potentially increase TH3. Uh, and I'll talk about that here shortly. Um, now, some of the agents I've listed here actually increase Th1, which we might not want to use. Um, so I, this is maybe not specific for Hashimoto's, um, but you know that would be medicinal mushrooms, echinacea, thymic extracts. Um, but I'll talk a bit in here about, in the next slide, about how we might think about Th3. Um, looking at pancreas insulin dysregulation, so I've seen uh, patients with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, uh, hyperinsulinemia. My thinking is that the high insulin is actually driving some of the inflammatory process and autoimmunity in Hashimoto's. So this is where we use a lot of our insulin sensitizing agents, um, uh, different herbs like uh, gymnema and bitter melon and whatnot, together with potential liver herbs, gallbladder, moving herbs, stimulant bitters, uh, gentiana, uh, angelica, archangelica, nicus benedictus, these would all improve the pancreas and that function. Uh, in the Chinese medicine circles, this would be spleen qi deficiency, so the different herbs that are used uh, for those kinds of patterns. Uh, chromium and zinc, we know, can support the insulin, as well as inositol. Uh, adrenal dysregulation, this would be basically a pattern of high cortisol, uh, the ratio of high cortisol to low DHEA. So DHEA is secreted in far larger amounts in cortisol. We can think of DHEA as more anabolic, whereas cortisol is more catabolic. And uh, this would be um, maybe herbs that we I call here stimulant adaptogens that would all upregulate the DHEA. So the, all the ginsengs, uh, Eleutherococcus, um, the Siberian ginseng, rhodiola, uh, the centella, schizandra, licorice, those kinds of herbs. 
Uh, vitamin B5, B5 and vitamin C are cofactors to need uh, that are needed to make proper DHEA and for adrenal steroid synthesis. And then selenium is an antioxidant in copper in small amounts, but beware about copper because that can actually suppress thyroid as well, especially in higher levels. Uh, any estrogen dysregulation? Um, again, estrogen usually impairs thyroid. Um, so usually we see more what we call an estrogen dominance picture. So we would not want to use phytoestrogens there. We'd want to probably improve liver clearance of the estrogen or upregulate androgens. And I'm going to put progesterone in this cat, uh, class as well. And that would be using phytoandrogenic herbs. In the Chinese medicine uh, literature, that those are known as kidney yang tonics, uh, together with iron and zinc. So those would be other patterns, and we'd have to go through our history and physical to kind of see where a person falls on those different patterns. Um, some of the micronutrients that are used, and some have more literature uh, than others, but of course iodine will be important, being sure we don't surpass our uh, upper limits there. Uh, the limits are going to be higher in pregnancy and breastfeeding per day. Um, selenium, uh, up to 200 micrograms a day to support glutathione and potentially the di diiodinases. Uh, zinc, uh, copper, again, if we're going to do zinc, but remember copper can have a thyroid inhibiting effect. Uh, magnesium and then iron to correct any potential deficiencies. This is kind of working at the mitochondrial level to remember the cytochromes require both copper and iron uh, for proper electron transport. And then vitamins, vitamin D, B12, and again, I should put A on there as well, would be potential vitamin therapies. Uh, L-tyrosine, so thyroglobulin is made of tyrosine, so that is sometimes added to thyroid supporting nutrients. So there are a number of products on the market with tyrosine, some of those thyroid supporting herbs or the uh, herbs like ashwagandha, the HPA axis herbs, uh, together with selenium and zinc and all the other cofactors to help with thyroid conversion. And uh, so that's often added in essential fatty acids to kind of work with the general immune response. And then the non-hormonal thyroid glandulars are often used. Um, uh, so there's many of them on the market. And then thyroid protomorphogens, so that's where the uh, glandular material is put into a centrifuge. It's spun down to separate the DNA and RNA, and that's what's freeze-dried and concentrated. And that was based on a theory of Royal Lee, who found a standard process back in the 1930s before we knew much about how, you know, uh, the structure of DNA and how it really worked, um, he felt that there was something in the nucleus of the cells, if you took it, would actually upregulate your uh, protein synthesis in different organs. And uh, so he developed the protomorphogens. Of course, from a modern biomedical perspective, that doesn't make sense because when you take, eat these orally, your digestive acid and juices would break down any, uh, you know, a DNA, RNA that might be found in there. But uh, I do have patients, and this is probably just anecdotal or, or what, but they uh, uh, swear by these supplements and they often, I can't get them off of them. They want to keep taking them because it, they feel it really helps them. So there's something going on there that definitely might need some further research. Uh, finally, there would be the category of mitochondrial support. And that'd be mitochondrial nutrients like L-carnitine, acetyl L-carnitine, CoQ10, lipoic acid, N-acetylcysteine, D-ribose, NAD, a new one on the market now is PQQ, and then selenium, magnesium, copper, and iron again. Um, so if you go out and look at books on how to treat Hashimoto's and, or go online, they often have a list of all these different supplements and they're really pulling from these three categories. Um, so I think clinically it's helpful just to know which category we're, we're actually working with. But that's a bit of an idea of maybe how to target level two therapies uh, for your patients. And this is where I would really start together with level one with my patients who were subclinical or patients who, uh, even with thyroid replacement, were still not responding uh, well to the therapy. Now I'll mention one final uh, area of treating Hashimoto's that's out there in the literature, and that is to address immune balance. Um, this was kind of put forward in several popular books like Dattis Karazian, why do I still have thyroid symptoms, uh, and so forth. And that would be addressing cytokines. So I mentioned that Hashimoto's, we think, is primarily a Th1 type disorder. Interestingly, Graves' disease, the other type of autoimmune thyroiditis causing hyperthyroidism, we think is primarily Th2, um, at least in the early stages. Uh, and then we, of course, need our regulatory T cells to balance these. So there's 
emerged from the functional medicine, naturopathic medicine angle. This idea of, for example, in Hashimoto's trying to upregulate either Th2 or try to upregulate the regulatory T cells. So let me start with that. So agents that we think can upregulate the T cells would be vitamin D. Now vitamin D is uh, like any nutrient, and I wanna be very clear about this, um, falls into the hormesis curve. So in hormesis, if this is zero dose, this is higher dose, this is positive effect on physiology, let's say thyroid metabolism, this is an inhibitory effect. You know, most substances we're finding have this curve where if you don't have any, zero, you have a negative effect. If we increase the dose, we start seeing positive benefits, but then it plateaus out. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the natural medicine angle feel like it's like this, it's just you keep going, keep getting more effect. And that's not the case. We now know that uh, these substances actually, uh, after a time, have an inhibitory angle. And the same with vitamin D, where you know, vitamin D, a lot of the benefits came out of those observational trials looking at people with heart disease and diabetes. They all had vi low vitamin D. So it was hypothesized that, well, maybe it's we could replace vitamin D and people would feel better and they would get better with their heart disease and everything. And we now are seeing the randomized control trials that do that, uh, doing vitamin D replacement. And we're actually finding they are not improving those outcomes. Uh, in fact, they might even be causing some harm in the higher doses. Um, so there's uh, a big concern now that vitamin D really was probably more of a biomarker of inflammation and everything and not so much the causative agent. And so that's why we're seeing a lot of the larger medical organizations backtracking now on vitamin D and sort of saying this was kind of a fad and uh, we need to obviously make sure we get optimal levels. But optimal for most people, they would argue from the more biomedical angle is between 800 and maybe 1200 IUs a day. Uh, and not more than that. Um, and uh, they also argue that some of our reference ranges for vitamin D testing, and I won't go into that here, are skewed and uh, that we need to reevaluate those. And probably a lot of people were categorizing as low vitamin D actually have normal vitamin D, um, but it's just based on our skewed reference ranges. Uh, that said, we do know in the physiologic levels, vitamin D, which actually is a hormone, it's not a vitamin, it's made the active form calcitriol is made by your kidneys. Um, and uh, so we can think of this as a kidney hormone really, but that's needed for proper Treg activity. Um, essential fatty acids, but usually we're talking about, you know, two, three, four gram dosages. And that's for a lot of people just not practical to do long-term. Uh, glutathione, and so we're seeing, uh, we know glutathione can upregulate the, the regulatory T cell responses. Um, so we're seeing some people give glutathione it's not well uh, absorbed orally, so they're giving uh, intravenous glutathione and whatnot. I think the strategy with glutathione is more give the body the substrates it needs, like selenium and uh, N acetylcysteine, which is a, a component of glutathione, the cysteine, and, uh, and support the liver, which is a major producer of glutathione. And then we'll see the plasma levels and the tissue levels increase. And that actually was studied where uh, in Iran where they gave patients chamomile tea or milk thistle tea and found that uh, two cups of that tea or one cup twice a day of that tea actually rose the blood glutathione levels to what you would get pretty much getting an IV injection. So it, uh, it, we're really beginning to think that we need to just encourage the body to make more glutathione. Uh, and so instead of supplementing it, maybe give it the, the conditions to do that. Uh, same with superoxide dismutase. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend these as supplements, but more as things to encourage to try to get the Treg activity. That said, I didn't put on here all the things like decreasing cortisol, increasing DHEA, decreasing insulin if there's insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. All of that would encourage proper Treg activity as well. So that's probably going to be our main approach. In terms of upregulating Th2, more allergy cytokines, and thereby decreasing Th1, pine bark extract, grapeseed extract, resveratrol, pycnogenol, green tea, caffeine, lycopene have all been recommended in various forms for that. Um, and then if we wanted to upregulate Th1, that's where we would get the astragalus, echinacea, licorice, uh, lemon balm, mushrooms, and so forth. Uh, and then to dampen Th1, think about boswellia and turmeric. Um, so these are some of the kind of functional medicine naturopathic strategies for that. 
I really, I find clinically this is not necessarily, it doesn't pan out. Um, had a lot of patients with uh, subclinical hypothyroidism uh, when we actually measured some uh, thyroid autoantibodies. So this was early Hashimoto's. My main treatment was to support the DHEA uh, and I use herbs like uh, astragalus and licorice root and they had a remarkable improvement in their clinical picture. Um, and so, you know, if we suspect they have a Th1 problem, why did this happen? So I have a real question about some of the original research that connected different cytokines with these different agents. You know, we everyone's gonna respond differently due to a variety of different factors. So I think it's a little simplistic to think about it in this way. Uh, I know it's very seductive to think about, we can upregulate this, downregulate that and so forth, but clinically it doesn't really pan out always uh, in such a clear way. So just keep that in mind uh, when you hear people uh, giving these therapies or if you have patients ask you about them, or if you go to a conference where they're presenting this information, uh, just be maybe a little skeptical and, and maybe maybe challenge those ideas to say, okay, where where is the actual clinical data to, to suggest that's true? Okay, so that's an overview for the uh, for hypothyroidism focused on Hashimoto's. We looked at all of the pathophysiology, the etiology, complications. Uh, looked at the uh, different assessment methods uh, with TSH and the different ranges as well as all the treatments using the therapeutic order level one through four. So that's a long discussion on that, but this is a very, very, very common condition that presents especially to functional naturopathic Chinese medicine practices. So it's good that we have a bit of a higher level of knowledge than maybe a typical physician has around this uh, so that we can give the patients the right resources and guide them to the right therapies. So that concludes it for the hypothyroidism video. In the next video, we'll look at hyperthyroidism.